All right, everybody, good morning. Thanks for coming out. Welcome all y'all right there on, online and at our campuses. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Jared. I have the joy of getting to be the senior pastor of these wonderful folks known as Grace Community. So a special welcome to you all. We're continuing, continuing in our series called In Focus, where we're focusing in on the teachings of Jesus, specifically around this Sermon on the Mount. And so uh, interested where we're here, where we're headed today and interested in what how you will respond to today. So let me pray and we'll go for it. Lord, thank you for all who have joined us. We need you. I pray you'd open our minds, open our hearts to receive, open the scriptures to our hearts and open our hearts to your very scriptures. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I used to really enjoy my iPhone until they added this one feature. It's been a long time when they, uh, when they added it a while back, but it still haunts me. Anybody familiar on the iPhone with screen time? Yeah, you nodding with me? Because in case you don't know, screen time is what records or captures how much phone usage you have. You're going online and things like that, using apps. And so I had in my mind that I really just used my phone when I needed it. You know, I used it and kind of did my thing. I didn't spend a whole lot of time on it until I checked out my screen time. And it was hours of time. And I couldn't believe that. Like, I would try to track it and go, there is no way I have spent that much time on my phone. But there it is. There are the facts. Well, today, we're taking a look at a screen time, you might say, in our hearts and in our lives. Because we may think a certain way about this topic where we're headed here in a moment, about how we use this and spend it and so forth. But in the end, the, the truth of it is found right before us in the scriptures and according to something very tangible in our lives, and that's our bank accounts. That's our wallets. So today, we're going to talk about money. Aren't you glad you came today? That's right. And the reason we're going to talk about it is because Jesus talks about it. You know, I'm one. I don't choose really... Uh, Put it this way, I probably would never choose to preach this. But as we follow scripture, verse by verse by verse, section by sec section, as Jesus lays it out, we're forced to deal with truths and topics that I might want to avoid as your pastor. And this happens to be one that Jesus has for us today. So let me read the text and then we will take a journey through it. Matthew 6, 19 through 24. Jesus says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So when I talk about money today, we're going to think of it as not just money, but money and possessions. I'm just using money just to rip the Band-Aid off, or we have to face that head on. So money, possessions, treasure, all those together, we're going to tackle it in terms of just money. But notice how Jesus is putting opposites by each other. And you can look at it this way. I'm bringing my lab out today. Y'all miss my lab lately? I had to pull it out, wipe the dust off of it. So Jesus talks about two different kinds of treasures. One treasure that is of the earth and then one treasure that's heavenly. Then he gets to the eyes, and he talks about there is a bad eye that can fill your body with darkness, but then there's the good eye that can fill your body with light. Then he gets to masters, and he says there's a master called money that can own you, but there's also the master known as Christ himself who can free you. Now, everybody in here was like, but if you're like me, I'm like, give me this. But isn't it interesting when we check out the screen time of our lives? How much is given to this? Oh, I'm ready to preach today, y'all. Y'all ready for some of this? Because I, I had to preach to me this week. And when it's hard to preach to me, I got to bring the hard to preach to you, all right? 
Okay, here's what we're going to know. We're going to learn three things about money today. Money exposes what's in you. Money exposes what fills you. And money exposes what controls you. So first of all, money exposes what's in you. And I say in you and me. Money exposes what's in you. Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The way Jesus really says this in the original language, he's saying don't treasure treasures. Whatever it is on earth, you treasure with all your heart. And, and notice the, how he begins this little section. Treasures can be not just for rich people. It can be for middle class. It can be for the poor. It has to do with what your, what, first what you treasure. treasure. Your treasure is what you value most in your life. Money or possessions or relationships or children or career or romance Whatever it is, it's what you value in your life. It's whoever or whatever in your life you would say, if I ever lost that, I don't know if I could ever recover. If I ever lost them, I don't know if I can make it. Or it could be something which you say, I will do whatever it takes to get it. I will do whatever it takes. I will pay any price to have it or have her or have him or have it or have that. You just discovered your treasure, whatever is at the end of that. And we all have some sense of that kind of treasure in our lives that, are, that, is, that is not life for us. It doesn't mean it's bad. It just means we have taken something that's a gift and we've made it God. And that's where it goes bad. We've taken something that, that is to minister to us and we've let it master us. We've taken possessions and we've been possessed by the possessions and so forth. This reveals the treasure. The treasure can also be found in your health. Uh, your, your, uh, your physique, your beauty, or your intellect, or your status, or your career, and again, your romance, or your image. But chiefly, Jesus is pointing to money and possessions here, because he talks about mo moth, rust, and thieves. Moth, rust, and th thieves. Here's the way I want you to think about it, just kind of a, in a more general way with each of those. God has wired into money and into possessions, and into your intellect, and into your body, into anything else we pursue. He has infected it in a good way. He has woven in it. He has threaded it with moth, rust, thieves, because they will never satisfy. Only Christ can satisfy. You pluck a flower to take home to your wife, fellas, or wives, I guess you can do that with your husbands too. You pluck that flower, it is beautiful, but the minute you pluck it, it begins to die. What's the word? My dad told me this years and years and years ago to prepare me. He said, if you ever buy a car, a new car, and you drive it off the parking lot, what immediately happens when you drive it off the parking lot? It depreciates immediately. Why? Because car people know cars are wired with moth and rust and thieves. And you can do that with any other Gadget, whatever money purchases for you in your life or mine, whatever possession it is, it will eventually lose its shine, lose its polish, lose its joy. It will eventually break or it'll need to be maintained and it'll need to be fixed. This is just the way of life because it's wired with moth and rust and thieves. I've never owned a boat, but for some reason this thought, this thought came to me because I heard this over the years. For you boat owners, I wonder if you would agree. I heard there are two of the happiest days of your lives when it comes to a boat. One is when you buy a boat. Two is when you sell the boat. <laughs> I got some claps. I got some boat owners in here probably. I don't know. But I will say this. In 2008, I got my heart's desire, a Harley Davidson, y'all. 2008. Yes. I know all, I got friends here. You ride on your Harleys to the church, and when I see you, I just salivate, all right? I have to wipe my lips because I love I love the way they sound. It was a dream. You guys, my mom, I was riding, when I was just a, a child, I was riding like a little Hot Wheels with a helmet on, pretending it was a Harley Davidson, pretending it was a motorcycle. So I've always wanted a Harley Davidson. So my dream came true in 2008. I got on my knees and I pleaded with Christy, could I please have a motorcycle? And she knighted me and said, yes, you may. And so 
uh, I got this Harley, and it was, um, I, I spent more time staring at it than, than riding it, but I began to ride it, and it was the joy of my life for about a month. <laughs> and all of a sudden, my back started hurting. My neck started hurting. I went to the chiropractor, and he's, I'm going to help you out. Nothing helped. My whole body hurt. My cousin said I looked like an elephant. Uh, I looked like an elephant on, on training wheels when I rode the thing because I was so much bigger than it. So maybe that had something to do with it. And then it went from that to I traveled all the time. So then the Harley sat in my garage, and after traveling the whole time, I would come home, and I would have to choose between my family and my Harley. And Christy and I remain married today because I chose the family, all right? But it was very difficult. It was very, very difficult. And then it got to the point I had to just, I had to make time to write it. I had to schedule it in to find, and all I could think about is it's sitting in my garage and I'm paying this money for this Harley and I'm actually trying to, are you with me? Moth, rust, thieves. So everything you can have and possess in the end is filtered with it's fit, it's it's threaded with it it's it's infected with it. Uh, Pastor Jeff's backstage reminded me I have this big picture of Johnny Cash this big thing of Johnny Cash in my office and he said he, he, here's what he said he said every possession you buy is just another stick to beat yourself with. Johnny Cash yeah right on time because why moth rust. Thieves, it doesn't satisfy it. it will, I mean, you take an athlete in their prime and you see them, other than Tom Brady, I don't know what's going on with him. He's hacked it somehow. But you see diminishment in athletes or you see athletes who have so much potential and they just have a nagging injury and they can never reach their full potential. It's heartbreaking, but it's moth rust thieves. Also, uh, physiques wither. Uh, I turned 50 this week, y'all, all right? Listen. You're clapping, but here's what I got to tell you. Moth, rust, thieves everywhere in myself. I feel it more than ever. And, you know, even intellect, your intellect over time, you know, it begins to diminish. It's not what it once was. You can't remember like you used to. Why? Moth, rust, thieves. So what does Jesus say as we face that predicament? He lifts us up and says, there's a greater freedom. There's a greater hope. There's a greater joy. But lay up, and here's what he says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So this is my moment to bring out dust off our blue tape mascot that I tend to bring out. So I, I recognize I haven't brought this out a whole lot in, in the past few months. So the way we look at this is that picture this rope going on for eternity that way and the rope going on for eternity that way. There's never an end. And then right in the middle of all that rope is your life. And we call it your blue tape life. This is it. This is you. Be encouraged. <laughs> this is you. This is, this is 90 years maybe, 95 years. If you're into essential oils, maybe longer, all right? But that's you. N that's it. And so Jesus is saying, why lay up treasure there where moth and rust and thieves destroy? Because you're going to spend a lot more time here. Wouldn't this be, I'm not even a financial guy, but I get this. Wouldn't this be the better investment for that which moth and rust will never destroy? Thieves cannot steal. Inflation cannot touch. Talk about thieves, all right? Inflation recession, higher taxes, won't touch this. But for some reason, our treasures, and we treasure everything in this little blue tape reality. No wonder we're devastated when our blue tape fails us. No wonder we're so disillusioned and disappointed when we're so focused on blue tape money and possessions and security as if we're really in control. We're let down every time, devastated every time, because this will always fail you. So Jesus is saying, set your eyes up. There's a greater freedom. There's a greater joy. There's a greater future to invest here. Your treasures, your money, possessions, it all, all to Christ. So do you? Will you? How are you? What would you say? 
Are you investing your treasures in it? Now, what does it look like to invest treasures in heaven? Here's 1 Timothy 6, 18. Do good, be rich in good deeds, be generous, willing to share. That's a good snapshot. Do good with people, loving people, serving people, rich in good deeds. Not, if you're going to be rich, if you're really pursuing wealth, pursue wealth in good deeds, doing good to others, especially those least, last, lonely, left out. Be generous, open hands. You know how not to be devastated and disappointed in your life, in your blue tape life? You live life like this, not like this. It's a life of take it, leave it. I trust you, open-handed. That's being generous. And then also willing to share, not being stingy, greedy, but how can you share with others the wealth, however you would define that in your life. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In other words, your heart moves toward what holds its gaze. Your heart moves toward what you stare at. So if you stare at and you're only thinking about and working around and providing for your blue tape, that's where you find your heart. It's where your gaze is. And this will break your heart. So where's your gaze today? Where's your heart looking today? What is it in your life? You're saying, I will pay any price to have it, to do it, to get it. Who in your life? What in your life? You're saying, if I lost it, I don't know if I could go on. Blue tape is a terrible God. So you look past to Christ for the, so what is this heavenly treasure? I don't even know what that is, but here's what I would think about it. Whatever you're investing, whenever you're there in the presence of Christ and there's this treasure you've been laying up, whatever that is, it, you, it, it's going to be unbearable in its glory, and you will behold it as if for the first time forever. It will be unbearable joy forever because you took Christ at his word, laid up these treasures in heaven. So there's a, there's a call to you. Will it be blue tape, treasures on earth that is filled with moth, rust, thieves, or Will you lay up treasures in heaven? And by the way, which one looks most free? Yeah, heaven. Make sure your investments are wise. Treasures in heaven. Because money, money and possessions are your treasure. That will expose what's in you. Secondly, money exposes what fills you. What fills you. Matthew 6, 22 through 24. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? So he's talking about the eye being a good eye. First of all, the good eye, meaning that whatever you gaze at, remember, if you're gazing at blue tape, then your body, your soul will be filled with blue tape. If you gaze at the earthly, you'll be filled with the earthly. If you're, if you're gazing at the earthly, that's, the, that's where you're fixed then that's what will fill your body. That's what will fill your life. But if it's on heaven, you will be filled with light. So what do we do with this? Well, Jesus is saying, you let your eye be healthy, meaning let your, let your eye have a singular purpose. Let your eye have an undivided loyalty. Okay, so a single purpose and an undivided loyalty to what? Well, it can't be blue tape. Then to what? Well, to watch Hebrews 12, 2, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. Colossians 3, 2, fix your eyes on things above, not on earthly things. Now, here's a really helpful one because we tend to see only what we can touch, see, feel, smell, hear. 2 Corinthians 4, 18, fix your eyes on what is unseen. For what you see is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So he's saying, fix your eyes off your blue tape that will disappoint you, will devastate you, will fill you with darkness and put it instead on the light. Put it instead on the heavens for that which you cannot see. Faith, trust, even what you cannot see. So let's look at this. Let me, let me drill down. Let's get a little more practical. Watch this. 1 Timothy 6. 
Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Let's go back to the first part of that scripture real quick. I want you to notice that. It says those who want to get rich. It doesn't say those who are rich. Because there are many rich people in scripture. Beginning with Abraham, the father of the faith, you might say. King Solomon. Most, if not all the kings. King David. Rich people supported Jesus' ministry and the ministry of Paul. So the scriptures do not look down on riches. The scriptures do not look down on people who hold riches. The scriptures look down on those whose riches hold them. That's the difference. But watch this. Those who want to get rich fall into these issues. So this, again, this points to everyone. It points to the poor. It points to the middle class. It points to white collar and whatever else is in between. Those who want it. That's the kicker. Those who want it. Those who desire it. Those who think about it. Crave it. And those desires plunge people into ruin and destruction. Next verse. For the love of money, that's a, that's a desire, is the root of all kinds of evil. Of evil. Some people eager eager for money, pursuing it as if it's all they, all they know for their blue tape, have wandered from the faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs. So you can look at this and go, okay, he's talking about greed. He's talking about envy. He's talking about coveting desires, longings, cravings for, for being rich. What do we do with this? Because you might hear those words and say, pastor, greed, not me. I'm not greedy. Coveting? No. Desire? I don't desire to be rich. I'd like some a little more security, but okay. Well, let's talk about that. Because Jesus says, if then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? So what we can do is we can justify our hearts, our lives, our desires and cravings without really looking at our screen time, the screen time of our wallets, the screen time of our bank accounts, the screen time of those versus what we give. And those begin to reveal something about us that might not be on point. And the danger is Jesus uses that phrase. Think about it. If I have light and I call myself, if, if I look into my life and my heart right now, as pastor talks about, I'm not greedy. I'm this. And Jesus says, no, 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 you're really this. And you're calling it this. How great is this? I don't think anybody wants to be walking out of here with this. That's why we're talking about it today. So we can be self-deceived. Well, how, how can we be self-deceived? Let me see if I can help us dig into our souls to see what might be lurking there if we're self-deceived. Tim Keller talks about this. He, he talks about three ways. I'll mention one more of how money can blind you. Here's the first one. He says, money's influence can blind you. In other words, we know when we lie, for example. If I lie, I know I'm telling a lie. If I lust, I know when I'm lusting. But greed, envy, often we don't even see it, recognize it, even in a room right now, believing it's not us. But let me see if I can help. Let's say over the next two weeks, I'm doing a little mini series, and I'm preaching on two, two subjects, two different subjects, and you can only choose to come to one. So two sermons over the next two weeks, but you can, due to your schedule, you can only choose to come to one. Which one would you come to? End times or sermon on greed? Which one would you come to? Sermon on the end times, sermon on greed. Come on, y'all. You know you come to the end times. 99, and for the 1% said, no, well, you just lied, so you don't count. I guarantee you, if I said two sermons, one for a 10, everybody would come to end times. Why not greed? Because many of us don't think we're really greedy. Many of us think we don't need to hear that. Maybe some don't want to hear that, but most of us, well, I don't need to hear it. Oh, beware that the light in you is darkness. If you're not dealing with what's really underneath. Okay, as if that's not enough, how about this one? Your lifestyle, my lifestyle. Take about, think about what do you spend, where do you spend it versus how much you're giving away. Now, that's tough to do, but let's really get painful. Get a small group together 
And you in the small group have this practice. Every month, each one of you are going to show each other's bank accounts. You're going to show what you spend, where you spend it, versus how much you give away. And you're going to give it to your small group to hold you accountable. Anybody want to join that group? I didn't think so. Why? Because we don't want anybody to know what we spend, where we spend it, versus how much we give. I don't even want to know. You don't even really want to know. You know what? I don't even hardly look at my screen time on my phone anymore, y'all, because I can't deal with it. I don't want to see it. And we can be just that way even in our financial life. So beware of self-deception. Here's a third one, work. I wonder how many, and this is what I've talked to my boys and, and daughters about, our, our two boys, oldest daughter, about their future. Don't take a job or a career for its money. Don't let money blind you because I know people who went to school, got a career, making great money, but hate their lives because you are miserable in your career because money did not satisfy, did it? Why? Moth, rust, thieves, and it makes a terrible God. But we can be, what happened? They maybe thought the light was really light, but it was dark. They pursued something more and now miserable. And I would add one more, and I would say this one would be giving. Giving in this way. How easy is it for us to justify spending it on that that's outside of what we should be spending? How easy to justify that. But when's the last time you justified giving all that to that? Very easy to justify the spending. Almost impossible to justify the big giving. You follow me? So Jesus says, beware that what you think is this in your heart could be this in your heart. Beware that you're self-deceived. So how about you? What would you say about money in your life? What fills you in terms of where you spend it, how you spend it, versus what you give? It's something to really consider because Jesus is reaching in and exposing the screen time of our financial lives to bring light, to bring, bring freedom. Jesus isn't teaching this to condemn or guilt or put people in their place. He's pulling out of you glory and freedom and the true God that would fill your life and give you hope and meaning. So money, money reveals what? It reveals what, what's in you, what fills you, and then lastly, reveals what controls you. What controls you? Money exposes what controls you. Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Key words there. One's devotion. Devotion means lined up face to face with. Jesus said, beware that you, th you think you're lined up face to face with God because you can't be lined up face to face with God when you're lined up face to face with blue tape or with money or financial, the financial life of your life. There's only one you can be in face to face with. And the other one is serve. Note that word serve. No one can serve. What do you do when you serve? You worship. You bow down. So he's saying those who, no one can bow down to two masters. And the word money there at the end is literally a Greek word called mammon. Which is, is, which is, to put it simply, money God. You cannot serve the master God who is for your joy and provision or the money God that is filled with rust and moth and thieves. David Foster Wallace, he spoke at a Ken Kenyan College 2005 commencement speech. Powerful speech. You can find, you can read it out there. You can watch it on YouTube. He's not a believer. He wasn't a believer. He passed away. He wasn't a believer. Here's what he said. He said, I don't believe in God, but there's no such thing as atheists. Think about that statement. He said, I don't believe in God, but there's no such thing as atheists. What, why did he say that, an atheist? Why did he say that? Because he used this word worship in his speech. And he says, everybody worships. And here's the way he put it in this little section. He says, if you worship God, I'm sorry, let me start again. If you worship money and things, 
If they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough and you will never feel you have enough. So let's go back to Jesus talking about masters. So he's saying something's your master and it can't be both. Either this is your master or he's your master. No, no, if you're like me, I think, well, can't you have a little both? Can you? Well, well, let's talk about that because because you think I, I can have a little bit of both, right? And so you, I got some both. I got some both in there. It doesn't work. Ah, oh, but then, oh, no. One always comes out on top. And notice the one that ends up on top the most. And you go, no, I love Jesus, but, you know, I live my life. And no, well, in time, it starts clearing up. And it shows who's really on top in your life. Now, you notice it's not as clear, right? Because that means our hearts will always be a bit tainted on this side of heaven. But it comes back to who's your master. And we see who tends to be the master most. And that's why we have sermons like this to come back to who truly should be and is to be our master, who has the greatest freedom and joy for you and me. Because in the end, remember the screen time of your financial life. Follow your wallet and you will find who and what you worship. Check your bank account out, and I say this with you, what you spend, where you spend it, and you will find what you worship. Follow the money and you will find God. Think about it this way. Keller talks about this too. Where does your money fly off in your life? Where do you spend money effortlessly? You might say, oh, generosity. Come on, y'all. Come on. Don't be self to see. I'm, I'm good. I help. And I, all right. No, we know most of it probably flies out to clothes and to fitness for some of us, food for the rest of us, upgrades, technology. So where, what, what's it about them? What, what makes us, what, what puts this battle in us where we would tend to justify it again? Keller says, significance and security, significance and security, significance in the sense of we might spend effortlessly toward our appearance or our body or our fashion or our image or luxury. In the end, we spend it toward approval. Dave Ramsey, the financial guru, he put it this way. He says, so many of us buy things we don't need to impress people we don't like. <laughs> many of us can go in that direction. But there's also security. And this is the one where you can, you, you, that might really expose some people. Because some people say, Pastor, I'm not greedy and this is not for me because I'm, I'm a frugal spender. I'm thrifty. I'm a penny pincher. And I would say, but are you giving? Or do you think penny pitching and being frugal and thrifty controls your life and controls the circumstances of your life? Now, don't get me wrong. Proverbs talks about saving and, and uh, accumulating and, and helping and supporting. It has that. But I'm asking, do you give? Are you generous? Are you a hilarious giver, as the Apostle Paul puts it, and not just someone who's frugal or, or thrifty? Because being frugal and thrifty is not going to save you from an illness. And it's not going to save you from a broken heart and a broken relationship. It's not going to save you from death. And you really want to go to your grave being frugal and thrifty? Or don't you want to go to your grave generous, generous in your life? So see, this is for all of us, isn't it? None of us can get away from this because it's an important subject for Jesus. He talked a lot about money and possessions. This is just one little section, but he got after it with all of us in this way, for our joy, for his glory, and for others' good. So what will it be? Will you recognize where this may be filling your life, blue tape, or that this is the invitation to a greater freedom? Or maybe, like most of us, no, you, you want to be this, but you know there's the battle, and we try to mix it, we try to justify it, but in the end, Something and someone comes out on top. Who is it? Who is it and what is it? And it can be different today. The chief 
call of your life and mine of freedom and joy in this area of our lives is found in Jesus. Fix your eyes on him, the author and perfecter of your faith. He gave up all treasure because you were his treasure. And he came to, the cro- he come, came to earth with nothing, no treasure for all his 33 years, born in a stable, laid in a manger, homeless as he walked and loved and healed, died on a criminal's cross, didn't even, didn't even have a tomb. Somebody had to give him a tomb. But he went to the cross and he took your poverty, my poverty, not financially, but of the soul. He took this, he took this, the darkness of our hearts and our minds and our wills, sin, and he was drenched in this. He poured out his blood for this so that on the third day he was resurrected to give you this. To, to give you life, to give you hope, to give you joy, to give you light, to give you his treasure. Listen, we've said this a lot over the years and it bears repeating. You only pay for what something's worth. You only pay for what something's worth. You'll only pay for what something's worth. Jesus paid it all for you and invites you to see him as worthy of it all. That he brings meaning and life and light into your blue tape and into the rest of this life until the life comes where you stand before him and you will stand before him whether you've done it or not like this. You will stand before him empty-handed and empty-pocketed. So why don't you start doing a little bit of that today to get ready for that day? Yes? All right, let's pray. Lord, I pray that uh, difficult subject, but so grateful you love us enough to tell us the truth. And so thank you for this good word for my own soul this week and for all gathered here and under the sound of my voice. And I pray, God, something breaks loose. I pray that light breaks through the darkness of our excuses, of our idolatry, of whatever we've treasured more than you to find your light coming in to set us free. And I pray there would be a tangible response today, God, that we would be more open-handed. We would be uh, hands unclenched, a, a take it or leave it of our lives. And Lord, I would even pray just for our church, there would be a breaking open of tithing in our church out of this just for the blue tape of the life in which we store up treasures of forever so that your forever church can impact our dark culture. Do something special even in that, God. But in the end, may our lives be one of just simply treasure to you. We love you. We praise you. Our hearts, help our unbelief that our hearts may be all for you. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.